the uh, seropig interferon is uh, sort of a new generation interferon. It's monopegulated. Um, it has been approved by the European Commission uh, years before the FDA approved it, uh, eventually in November 2021. Um, the talk was really giving updates on uh, the clinical trial results uh, using ROPEG interferon, particularly uh, the PROUD and CONTI-PV study, uh, which randomized high-risk patients who had PV uh, to receiving either ROPEG interferon or receiving hydroxyurea. Uh, and the key there was that dosing used in ROPEG interferon uh, was sort of a, a low dosing at, at a start of the trial with slow dose titration, uh, generally going from 100 to 150 to 200 uh, at every two-week intervals until uh, hematologic response is achieved. Uh, in that uh, clinical trial, the complete hematologic response rate, being a primary endpoint, uh, was um, you know achieved in over 50% of patients in both arms, the hydroxyurea and the ROPEG arm. Uh, but really, the key there was that uh, in the first year, the responses were faster with hydroxyurea. Uh, and over the, the extended follow-up on the study, the complete response rates uh, were significantly higher um, in the ROPEG arm compared to hydroxyurea. Now, given this was a non-inferiority trial, uh, you know, ultimately, it was thought that both drugs are capable of achieving complete hematologic response, um, except that, you know, ROPEG had potential uh, durability over hydroxyurea. The continuation PV study, patients who continued for longer than the first uh, one to two years, um, it actually gave us uh, some uh, good data, good results on what happens to the molecular response uh, and what happens in terms of survival, event free survival, um, with these two lines of therapy. Um, and ROPEG interferon uh, achieved a significantly greater and durable uh, molecular response, where the median uh, JAK2 allele frequency uh, more than five years after initiating the study was less than 10%. Whereas in the hydroxyurea arm, uh, the uh, uh, JAK2 allele frequency uh, was generally greater than 40%, uh, which is greater than the average um, uh, JAK2 allele frequency at the start of the therapy. Um, so this also came with a, a greater event-free survival in the ROPEG interferon arm. Uh, and this event-free survival uh, over 90%, really approximately 94%, uh, compared to uh, a event-free survival uh, of about 81% in the hydroxyurea arm. Um, so this uh, was statistically and, and clearly a clinically significant uh, difference in event-free survival, uh, which was defined as survival-free of having uh, disease-related events, namely uh, thrombotic events, uh, disease progression, uh, and death. So uh, the, this was one of the main updates. Uh, the other update was uh, also published, and this was a low PV clinical trial. There were two publications that came out, uh, one in Lancet Hematology and later in New England Journal of Medicine um, uh, subjournal. And this low PV trial really uh, solidified the uh, high, high level evidence that ROPEG interferon is superior to what is still considered standard of care uh, in treating low risk PV patients. Uh, and what is considered standard of care is phlebotomy only, uh, obviously with the use of aspirin. Um, and where uh, ROPEG was superior was achieving the composite uh, endpoint of hematologic response without disease progression. And disease progression here was defined really as uh, having a thrombotic event um, or disease progression as we know it, uh, which is rare to see in low-risk patients in a year or two, but it also included uh, symptoms progression. So um, ultimately what was shown is that ROPEG interferon not only achieved a better hematologic response, but patients felt better. So those who uh, started with a high burden of uh, disease-related symptoms, uh, there was a, a clear benefit uh, on ROPEG where patients symptomatically improved. Uh, and most importantly, the rate of adverse events were low. Uh, there were no, uh, uh, there were a few grade three events, but most of the uh, events were grade one or two. And the most common one was actually neutropenia, which in clinical practice is generally not a, not a clinically significant um, uh, abnormality. Uh, liver enzyme abnormalities was another finding, which is often also uh, a lab abnormality that doesn't have clinical significance uh, and can be addressed with uh, dose reduction.
So these two trials were very important in terms of giving updates about ROPEC. Uh, what I also went into is discussing uh, the issue of dosing. Uh, how do we dose patients, um, whether it's with PV or other uh, MPNs uh, when using ROPEC? Uh, there is a, a heightened interest in, uh, at least from the uh, pharmaceutical side, of uh, studying uh, what I what I refer to as a max dose ROPEC. Uh, and that's sort of a, a fast titration of dosing uh, from a 250 microgram starting dose uh, to 350 two weeks later to 500 uh, two weeks after. So uh, in the first four week period, patients are escalated all the way up to a dose of 500 micrograms, which is a, a, a major shift from the traditional dosing uh, that the Proud PV started with of 100 going up by 50. Um, and so what the rationale uh, there is uh, could be the idea that perhaps a faster dose titration, if tolerated by patients, um, that could lead to a complete hematologic response faster. Uh, and why is that important is perhaps if you get there faster, uh, you could limit the probability or the opportunity for disease-related events to occur in that time frame. Um, and what I presented was some uh, phase two studies uh, uh, some in Asia that have actually uh, looked at this dosing schema, and they were they were not randomized trials; they were different trials with cross trial comparison. Um, and it appeared that in both the Proud PV study and in a study in Japan uh, of about twenty nine patients, um, that doing the kind of low dose with slow titration led to a, a complete hematologic response at a median time of twelve months. Uh, whereas a study in China, uh, which was, um, I believe, about 50 patients, maybe 49 patients to be specific, uh, and that study showed um, that the max dose approach led to a complete hematologic response at a median time of three months. So three months versus 12 months, uh, of course, these are, again, different trials, different patients, uh, but at least uh, two and our own study, so three studies in total, have shown that this uh, low dose, low titration approach achieves a 12 month median CHR, um, whereas perhaps if we can get to a CHR, the uh, median CHR at three months, um, that we're really cutting down uh, nine months of potential thrombotic events. And this becomes important uh, when we think about some of these PV patients who are recently diagnosed. Uh, it is uh, well known now that the risk of thrombotic events is very high uh, from the time of diagnosis and around the first year or two from diagnosis. Um, and that's been shown in population studies, our own data sets. Uh, and so perhaps, you know, limiting the amount of time by which patients have uncontrolled counts that continue to require phlebotomies might uh, translate to a better uh, event-free survival from both its free survival difference. Uh, but that, is, that remains to be proven. Um, and currently, uh, there is an ongoing clinical trial, uh, the Eclipse PV study, uh, which was sort of redesigned to um, uh, ultimately compare um, uh, the low and slow dose titration of ROPEG to the max dose um, approach uh, in a randomized uh, fashion. Um, so we await the results of this trial eagerly to see if uh, you know the the really the time to hematologic response is truly uh, significantly different, and if that translates to some uh, meaningful secondary endpoints, perhaps of uh, event-free survival from bosis-free survival. Um, finally, well, not finally, two more things actually. So I also presented. Um, the results of the uh, our own institutional experience uh, to retrospective study, if you will, that compared ROPEG in PV to PEG PV, um, PEG interferon. And the way the study was done was really as a propensity score matched um, uh, case control study uh, where we took all cases of uh, ROPEG interferon treatment um, since the FDA approved it in November of 2021. Uh, we identified 44 eligible patients um, who were on ROPEG, and we found a matching cohort of PV patients treated with PEG interferon. Um, we matched patients based on age, based on baseline hematocrit, um, and baseline, based on the ELN uh, risk categorization. Uh, so we had a matching number of uh, ELN high-risk patients, so it was roughly about uh, 
44 to 48% uh, of the cohort, um, and then the baseline hematocrit was similar. Uh, the purpose of this comparison was to generate some data, which we don't have yet, but it's, uh, uh, it is, to my knowledge, first of its kind, data comparing what is new, uh, the new interferon, to the interferon we've been using for a long, long time. Um, and the idea there is really not necessarily to establish superiority, but it's really a matter of making sure that, you know, we now use a drug that's FDA approved, but actually has at least a similar efficacy to something we've been so accustomed to uh, and be able to use that uh, information uh, to understand that what we're doing is, um, you know, is certainly uh, either to the betterment of patients or at least uh, not worse than, than uh, how we practiced previously. Uh, and certainly hematologic response rates were very comparable. In fact, aerobic interferon um, seemed to have uh, a, a quicker response at the three month time point. Um, and that is actually all with the low and slow dose titration. So uh, it, it is comforting to know that the responses are at least similar and maybe even faster. Um, what was also nice to see is that the, although the toxicity profile was overall similar, uh, there was perhaps a, a, a lower, a statistically significant, but it was a lower, um, uh, it was a lower uh, flu-like symptom uh, frequency of about 6% in the ROPEG arm compared to the greater than 20% in the PEG arm. Um, so perhaps, you know, this kind of novel formulation uh, could be uh, better tolerated from that aspect. Uh, and I think that's all encouraging to see. Um, finally, we talked about uh, ongoing, uh, you know, phase two and three clinical trials uh, for ET uh, and a trial for uh, primary malafibrosis, first of its kind. Uh, the trial is called uh, HOPE PMF. Uh, and this trial is looking to, or will we'll be looking to enroll patients who have prefibrotic myelofibrosis um, or low risk to intermediate one risk uh, primary myelofibrosis. So really we're targeting kind of the early MF uh, patient population. Uh, and these patients will be randomized two to one to receive the ROPEG uh, intervention versus placebo. It's double blinded. Uh, and I think this trial is necessary because for a very long time, uh, the treatment of early or prefibrotic PMF has been a watch and wait approach. Um, and so the placebo here serves as a watch and wait um, with a, a two to one randomization favoring an intervention that has, has uh, a significant scientific and clinical basis. Um, we have a long history of using a PEG interferon in the treatment of early myofibrosis. Uh, we have generated phase two data at our center um, and others have uh, looked at this too with some reports of a clear disease modifying activity, reversion of fibrosis, uh, you know, and clinical improvement. Um, so this trial I think will be very important. The primary endpoint of the trial is a clinically relevant complete hematologic response, uh, which is sort of a modification of the IWG ELN um, uh, uh, hematologic response criteria uh, and uh, taking into account that no thrombotic events occur uh, during, um, you know, when this response is achieved. Um, and that's important because it's there's clear recognition that thrombosis uh, remains uh, um, uh, higher than average or higher than expected risk in these uh, primary MF patients. Um, in addition to that, symptoms response will be looked at um, as a primary endpoint as well. Uh, and then secondary endpoints will include uh, interesting things like, you know, bone marrow reversion potentially um, and event-free survival, uh, really important things that we need to know but do take a little while to, um, to, sh to show a difference. Uh, and so this trial is uh, one year at the core study and then there's a one-year extension to really help kind of tease out some of these secondary endpoints. Perhaps we see some uh, reversion in the bone marrow at uh, the first time point, which is the end of the year, uh, and the second time point, which is at the end of the extension follow-up. Um, and then we can collect uh, any potential events that occur uh, to be able to demonstrate um, all the advantages of using, uh, potential advantages of using ROPEG uh, in this uh, early uh, myelofibrosis population. Um, and before I end, I just want to add that this you know, trial not only has some rationale from uh, PEG interferon data and, and longstanding experience, but it also has uh, a data from a phase two study. 
um, that was led by uh, Dr. Gill and presented at uh, ASH last year um, that showed that ROPEG interferon in really a more heterogeneous population of MF patients, uh, both primary and secondary, um, has led to high rate of hematologic responses, um, in, impressive rate of uh, molecular responses ranging between 44 and uh, I believe 71%. Um, and you know, these molecular responses were across the board between CALR and JAK2 mutated uh, myelofibrosis. Um, so, you know, so it's, it's comforting to know that patients really respond well to the drug, um, and responded well in that trial, um, that it was a well-tolerated drug and the outcomes so far are favorable. And we certainly look forward to the randomized uh, clinical trial um, that hopefully will put ROPEG uh, on the map for uh, the treatment of myelofibrosis.